Hi, this is Guy Wallace with another video in my series, Adventures in Performance-Based Training and Development. I've also subtitled this series, The Insomnia Solution, but not for my insomnia, but perhaps for yours, and of course I'm just kidding. Today I'd like to talk about aligning to the voice of the customer at three levels. This is based on a presentation that I first did in 2002 for the ISPI conference, which was rated in the top 10 at the conference of all the sessions that had been given that year. And so I was asked to do an encore presentation the next year in Boston um, in April of 2003. Uh, so depending on your organization's purpose, size, uh, complexity, and culture, your instructional systems design or HPT systems purpose, size, organization, complexity, and culture, uh, getting aligned to the voice of the customer can be relatively easy or very difficult. It's going to be easy if you are small or your focus is narrow, therefore your situation is less complex. However, if you are a larger organization and your focus is broad across the entire organization, then your situation is more complex and it's going to be trickier to get this alignment put in place. Now if you were only focused on say the sales function or the engineering function, that's narrower and going to be a lot easier to make sure that you're aligned. But if you're tackling everything in the corporation from a learning and development or training and development perspective, then that's going to be more complex. Getting aligned to the voice of your customers and your stakeholders is going to be tricky. So getting aligned to the voice of the customer happens at three levels as my title suggested. Uh, the first level, number one at the top, is the enterprise and that's done through a governance mechanism and we'll talk about that in just a bit. The second level in the middle is a functional alignment. Now one could do this by looking at various processes or value chains within the organization but I think you need to look at this from a functional standpoint and then secondarily look at the processes uh, that your people in the function are enabling, are supporting, are performing within. Um, and so I like to take a functional approach to this middle tier. Again, there are several different ways that this can be done. At the third and the bottom level, um, is, which is really fairly important, is the process performance or performer level. And that's when we take on individual projects within this hierarchy to get things done as a line to the critical business issues of the enterprise. And that's what it's all about. It's all about affecting performance, not creating learning content, not getting um, high scores in butts in seats or butts on sites measures, but truly impacting performance for the good of the organization. Each approach uh, can be done, all three of these can be approached either very formally or informally and again a lot of that really requires you understanding the complexity of your organization, the culture of your organization. Uh, I'm going to be talking about the more formal approach here because informally you can just meet with people in a kind of an ad hoc manner and get their uh, critiques their suggestions, their demands of you, and you can then go forth and uh, attend to those. But in a complex organization, in a large organization, that's not easy. People don't necessarily agree easily. They won't come to consensus easily. And so you need to find a mechanism to generate a consensus view of what your marching order should be as you tackle the critical businesses issues of the organization. So again, there's three levels. The voice of the customer at level one is the enterprise level, two is the functional level, and three is a project level. At the enterprise level, level one, we can align to the voice of the customer and we'll know what that means when we truly feel that we are wired into the critical strategic needs of the business uh, and our contributions and the results forthcoming are seen as adding value and not just cost. If your enterprise leaders are governing your efforts and providing you with timely and sufficient resources and feedback, uh, that's the best place to be. They influence what and when, but not necessarily how 
to conduct the project or how to impact performance. As a professional, that's what you bring to the party. They know what they need. Your job is to make that happen. If they pro start prescribing what you are to do and how you are to do it, then you don't have a trusting situation. And of course, if that happens, the best thing to do, in my view, is to go ahead and do what they ask for, let them know what you think about what they're asking you to do and how they're asking you to do it, um, and giving your professional advice. Uh, but nonetheless, at the end of the day, you salute and carry out their marching orders, so to speak. Uh, in my view, the customer, the enterprise leadership, owns all of the business decisions inherent in any ISD effort. There's a lot of things that ISD professionals should attend to, should make the decisions on, should do the planning and carry it out. But again, what we're to address and when we're to address it is a business decision, not an instructional systems design decision. How to align when you're informal? Uh, when you're smaller and you can use an informal mechanism, you just meet with people in their offices. You go to lunch or dinner with them. You get their perspectives, their uh, feedback, uh, their directions through that informal mechanism. And that may work for you, and it may not. It could backfire. You could be listening to the wrong people, taking their advice, and of course you'll probably suffer the consequences later for making that mistake. Formally, when your situation is more complex, you might establish what could be called a board of governors. Now, if you don't like that language, change it. Uh, you know, adopt what you can and adapt the rest. Uh, a board of governors can be formed to formally set strategic direction for the training and development or learning and development or ISD organization. And your strategic plans should align and fall into place as a result of the strategic plans of the rest of the functions that you serve and the enterprise as a whole. Um, you can establish a separate set of meetings with a board of governors or you can latch on to all meetings that are already going on with the leadership team and joining them. Um, again, if your situation is more complex, you're dealing with a larger organization, you probably need to have meetings that are geared towards only addressing your needs and not just becoming an agenda item uh, in the mix with all the other leadership issues. You really want focus. Uh, your customers, your leadership should want you to have that focus. So this might be something that you need to negotiate uh, with the leadership about uh, to try to put in place some formal mechanism to get their will addressed. Um, uh, this picture that I'm showing here is a more formal look at this. There's the governance board at the top, and you have the functional advisory councils, which we'll talk about next, supporting that governance board. Uh, requests come up through the system. Decisions and resources flow down to the functional areas, uh, the functional advisory boards and to the projects that they undertake then on behalf of the organization trying to meet its uh, strategic initiatives and imperatives. How do you know that uh, you may be misaligned at level one? Well, the signals are uh, project priorities are constantly changing. Leadership wonders out loud what they're getting for all the resources consumed, where, where for all the budget they're allowing you to have. Uh, people and resources are often cut um, uh, whenever things get tight. That's because they don't see you as a strategic resource doing their will, getting their needs met. You must be working on the wrong things if that's happening. Or you're working on the right things and they just don't know about it. And that's a shame. Um, the cost to the enterprise for being misaligned is that projects are not targeted on the critical business issues. They're going after some low-hanging fruit or something in the middle. Projects don't achieve their forecasted ROI or economic value added goals, which should always be part of the equation when you're looking at what projects should we undertake. The organization can't afford everything that it might need. It's going to have to prioritize. And again, that prioritization is the work of the leaders, the customers. It's their voice. 
budget cuts and staff reductions may defer problems being resolved and that's no good for the enterprise. So the cost of the enterprise for allowing this misalignment to continue uh, can be quite costly. And so it's in the enterprise's best interest for you and the leadership to get aligned. The second level of my model here is a functional advisory council system. You know you're wired into the more critical and strategic business needs of the functions or business units or customer segments depending on what the nature of your ISD shop is all about. Um, your contributions and results should be seen as value adding. <clears throat> These are the people that should be defending your budgets and not allowing it to be cut when times get tough. If you're adding value, if you're really helping them with their strategic imperatives, solving the problems that are most important to them, uh, then you'll be safeguarded. But that's tricky, and you can't do that at the last minute when it's time to cut budgets. Uh, your functional leadership should be prioritizing your efforts and providing timely and sufficient oversight and support. You need to have the right subject matter experts, although I don't like the phrase or the use of subject matter experts. I want a special type of subject matter expert when I'm doing my instructional systems design work. I want master performers what the late Tom Gilbert called exemplars. But I was uh, disabused of using that uh, term by my clients at Motorola back in 1981, and they were happy when I said, well, how about master performers instead? You can use star performers, you can call them whatever you want. It should be clear, though, I wanted people who were performing the jobs at a level of mastery the day before I started meeting with them on some instructional systems design project. I had once gotten uh, misled in a critical project for my customers back at Motorola back in the day, 1981, um, when they gave me the corporate subject matter expert on a purchasing course. And after the pilot session had bombed terribly, uh, it was mentioned to me that that corporate subject matter expert hadn't been in the field for seven years. So their knowledge was seven years out of date. They did not know what was going on in the field currently in the purchasing world where they were the corporate subject matter expert. <clears throat> but I was young and uh, that was part of my learning experiences. So I got burned and I learned. Um, if, your, if your customers at the functional level are prioritizing your efforts, then you should be pretty darn sure that they are guiding you, directing you to the critical business issues of the organization. And if they've gone to the uh, uh, advisory, as an advisory group, if they've gone to the governance board and gotten sanctioning uh, the okay and the resources to spend on their projects with you doing the work, then you can be pretty well sure that you're aligned. Now you've got to deliver results though. Um, the functional groups, just like the uh, governance board, they own the business decisions, not the instructional system design decisions, but the business decisions about what to address and when to address it. And of course, they're going to give you your feedback on you know, how you go about doing that and what you produce in order to help them, but the proof is in the pudding. If you've pilot tested your offerings successfully and they demonstrate success, then you're on the road to continued success. How to align when you're at the uh, for, with the functional level? Informally, again, you can just meet with the leaders of the functions, the sales leaders or the engineering leaders or the merchandising leaders or the HR leaders, and determine what their needs are for their function. Who are the critical performers within their function and what are the critical processes that they're working on? They know, and there's no sense for you trying to guess. You might as well hear it directly from them. Um, and that works when, when you're in a simple situation here, when you can just meet with them and it's more casual. But if it's a large organization and you have uh, six, seven, eight strategic business units, all with function, the same functions strewn throughout the organization in some central group back at headquarters, uh, that becomes trickier. Not everybody's going to agree on what the number one priority is. 
you have seven strategic business units, it's likely that you have seven number one priorities and seven number two priorities and seven number three priorities, etc., etc. The trick then is to get them to come to a consensus on what is the number one priority across all of them and two and three and four and five. And what resources is it going to take, people wise, dollar wise, etc., in order to address their needs? These are business decisions as to what the priorities are and the allocation of resources to you to carry out their will is also a business decision. Formally, to address a more complex situation, you'd want to set up the functional, uh, excuse me, the advisory councils based on the functions or the processes, however you want to align at that middle tier in my model, um, and meet with them in a routine manner because things change and often, uh, sometimes, not always, but uh, you need to stay abreast as to what's going on in the organization, what are the today's critical business issues, and if push comes to shove and you don't have resources to do everything uh, to meet their needs, then they need to decide which projects should be put on hold or simply cut and not continue. Again, those are business decisions. Um, this next graphic here shows that functional advisory councils sitting in between the governance board and project level voice of the customer. Uh, what are the signals and costs of being misaligned at level two? Well, the signals are that the ROI and business case reasons for conducting projects is often murky. No one really knows what you're going to get from these efforts. When you expend shareholder equity, when you turn shareholder equity into learning content, instructional content, it better have a return somewhere down the line. And sometimes it's not obvious or immediate. And when your customers are making those decisions, uh, you're a little bit more safeguarded from that. Perhaps there's secret uh, uh, things going on, strategic things going on that you aren't going to be made aware of fully and they need to put the pieces of the puzzle in place only when only they themselves may know what that puzzle is going to look like when it's all laid out. And so they need to think about well, what they need to put in the first wave and the second wave and the third wave so that at some point they have all the pieces put in place necessary for their part of the business. Uh, when projects don't have support and sponsorship, uh, then it's difficult to get the right master performers and other subject matter experts involved. And uh, that's the kiss of death for many projects. If you've got the wrong people, uh, that's the equivalent of garbage in, garbage out. Good stuff in, good stuff out. I always pair those phrases uh, together because I don't want to be negative and just talk about garbage. I want to talk about doing good work, good stuff, getting good results for the organization. And that's what's going to require the top people. And breaking the top people, the master performers, away from their work temporarily is short-term pain for hopefully long-term gain. And if you're deciding what projects need to be worked on, not everybody's necessarily gonna buy into the fact that you understand the needs of the business adequately so that you can ensure long-term success, uh, long-term gain for that short-term pain. Uh, project target audience and their managers often wonder out loud you know, what are they getting for all these resources and their people being pulled into projects and all that? What, what, for what purpose? And if that's the kind of voices that you're hearing, then you're in trouble. Now, the cost of the enterprise to being misaligned at this level is that resources are often targeted at uh, non-strategic, the low-hanging fruit kinds of efforts, and the ROI is not going to be sufficient and it might have been invested elsewhere, the investment money, uh, and the economic value add is going to be negative or nil. Um, projects are dropped midstream for other priorities because you're in turmoil, because you don't have agreement, a consensus agreement, from the top and the middle as to what you should be working on project by project. Um, and it's just all too prevalent across the L&D landscape really since I've been in the business since 1979. 
uh, aligning at the third level, the project level, where you're really addressing the needs of organizations, uh, teams, individual performers. Um, you really need to be focused on the process performance requirements. People work in processes. There are more critical processes and less critical processes and processes you've got to have, but if they you know, went to pieces, it's not going to hurt too badly. But there are processes that if they don't work well, are going to hurt the organization. They're going to hurt the reputation of the organization. Uh, people themselves can be physically uh, hurt. Um, there's just a lot of issues uh, that training and development, learning and development, instructional systems design folks should be attending to. Um, master performers and subject matter experts are, are contributing to your efforts, the right people working on the right stuff at the right time when you're aligned. And it, isn't that really what it's all about? Because it's not about learning, it's about performance. And to get the best performance impact from your instructional content is probably going to require that you have the top master performers who understand what authentic performance looks like. What are the tasks that need to be performed? What are the outputs to be produced? And what are the stakeholder requirements that must be met? What are the barriers to ideal performance? And how do you avoid the barriers in the first place? And if they're unavoidable, what do you do? How do you recover? Master performers know these things. We need to tap into master performers or exemplars or star performers or whatever you want to call them. And it's not that an SME, a subject matter expert, can't be a master performer. They, in fact, might be. But you need to differentiate between people who know a whole lot about a topic and people who actually can perform to a level of mastery. There's a big difference. Aligning to the process uh, and performers at a project level uh, informally again you can just meet with your clients and you can meet with subject matter experts on the fly and master performers on the fly and do observations and interviews and review documents um, but if you're not really aligned well you're, you're probably not really sure that you're talking to the right people that you're observing the right people and that you're looking at the right documents formally when your situation is more complex, you're going to need master performers and perhaps other subject matter experts from across the various strategic business units or the divisions or the organizations that you're serving. Um, and to get the right people, you're really going to have to be in line in doing, aligned in doing the work that the top of the organization really wants and that the functions themselves realize is really critical and then they're going to free up the resources because you're doing work for them to their ultimate benefit. And again, garbage in, garbage out, good stuff in, good stuff out. Don't forget to pair those two phrases. Um, when you have project teams, I like to uh, work in, in a facilitated group process where I assemble uh, master performers and perhaps other subject matter experts, you know, maybe there's new regulations coming down the pike and the master performers won't know what the new regulations might be, but people from the regulatory groups inside the enterprise, they may know. So we may need subject matter expertise to augment what the master performers already know. Um, but to get these people assembled and to work together can be tricky. So again, when we're aligned, we'll get more of that kind of support. We'll get the right people at the right time to do the right kinds of things. I assemble teams into project steering teams so that there can be some oversight by the business of my business as an instructional systems designer. Um, I assemble master performers and other subject matter experts and sometimes managers and supervisors and sometimes novice performers into project teams that are, have some subsets. I like an analysis team to focus on well, what is the terminal performance that's required? What performance is required? What are the enabling knowledge and skills that one needs to know in order to be able to do? And then I take that kind of data and look across the organization at the existing inventory of content trying to reuse what, uh, what shareholders have already invested in.
and my clients normally like to hear that unless they know that what they've got isn't very good and then they tell me not to do that step. That has happened. Um, I'll need people to sit in a pilot test so that I can do what, what I like to call a full destructive pilot test. You know, I mean, if my instruction uh, is subject to being not adequate to meet the needs of the people out there in the business, I need to know that before we release it and let everybody take it. Uh, having it work for only half of the target audiences isn't good enough. Um, and we need to break the instruction, if you will, whether that's uh, uh, job aids uh, for performance support, uh, standalone, or whether that's job aids that need to be taught how to use them in training, or training when we need people to memorize things and have it at the ready when the situation comes up, and maybe we need to hone skills. Sales call skills are tricky. Uh, interpersonal skills are tricky, and normally we need to have more than one practice opportunity and we need to give timely feedback, relevant feedback to shape the behaviors of people over time. If you've ever taken a tennis lesson or a golfing lesson, uh, your coach can tell you all about it and you may have uh, uh, done that and maybe gotten frustrated because you can't seem to master what your coach was trying to teach you. And that's probably because you had insufficient practice with direct feedback on what you're doing right to reinforce what you're doing right and what you're not doing not quite so right, corrective feedback. Um, so an organization uh, of a, a structure that would help facilitate this alignment to the voice of the customer at three levels would end up looking like this. And when you're working on projects on behest of the functions, as approved and sanctions by the um, uh, advisory council, the leaders of the enterprise, uh, you have greater assurances that you're working on the right stuff. And of course, now this begs the question, are you and your people sufficiently qualified, capable of creating performance-based instruction that'll truly have the positive impact that everybody's desiring. Um, if you're not um, aligned at this level, uh, the signals that you'll see is that you're going to have a lack of customer involvement and support. You won't get the credible master performers. You'll get whoever they can afford to give you to meet your needs without impinging on meeting their own needs. Uh, Post-deployment evaluations might suggest that your content isn't really up to snuff. It's not meeting the need, and therefore you'll see a deterioration of people uh, participating in, registering for, depending on the nature of the content. They're just going to avoid your content, and it will sit in your LMS and perhaps never be used because its reputation might precede it. The cost of the enterprise when you're in this fix where you're not aligned at this project level is that you're going to have a lot of rework. You may have to repilot a lot of content, uh, and you're going to waste a lot of budget doing that because the content that you created is inaccurate or incomplete or inappropriate in the first place, and that could have been stopped had you had the right people involved. Again, if you don't have the right people involved, it's garbage in to your process and garbage out of your process. You'll get insufficient use of field and staff support in project efforts. Um, when you need to go pilot test things um, and to really prove out before you do a general release of your content um, that your content is actually worthy of participation by the target audience that you were intending. And you'll have insufficient, uh, inefficient use of your ISD professionals. Uh, they'll be just cranking out content when they could be impacting performance. So if you, there's many things that you might work on here. You need to establish perhaps a more formal relationship with all the constituencies that you serve. And rather than talking to them one-on-one -on -one or in a series, um, and all you're going to get is noise. And you need to find a way to find some signals within the noise about what the true needs of the enterprise are. 
and if you can help organize your customers so that they can put better demands on you and your organization, the better off everybody will be. Um, so you need to also then make sure that your organization is at the ready to really serve them, to really impact performance because you have methodologies in place that look at performance and is more than just cranking out learning content. You need to engineer or architect your learning content and you need to use the science of learning and make sure that the practices that your people employ as they conduct their projects are valid. That brings us to a wrap in this video in my adventures in performance-based training and development with your host, me, Guy Wallace. This is also known as the Insomnia Solution, but again, not for my insomnia, but perhaps for yours. And I'm just kidding. Good luck. Cheers.